<laughs> um, I just wanted to start by, I know you've, you've had a very long and very and distinguished career as a <laughs> actor, director, divisor, writer, teacher, all that number of things. Can you just give us like a snapshot of where you began and just a kind of brief little overview of <laughs> the career of Ned Manning? Career of Ned Manning. Well, actually I began in Canberra. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Canberra Repertory was my first uh, uh, sort of semi-professional acting role in a play called uh, um, Female Transport, uh -huh. and I played Billy. It was a cast for about 40, um, and Ross McGregor was the director, and I did about three or four plays at the Canberra Rep. And then I auditioned for, um, they were doing Equus, and I auditioned to play The Boy. Um, what was his name? Alan Strain. Yes. Yeah. And I didn't get cast, no. and I was so pissed off. <laughs> but I went and wrote a play, <laughs> and I thought, if they won't put me in a play, I'll write one for myself. So I did, and it was called Us or Them, and we did it at Tilda Street Hall, and with some teachers on the staff at Watson High where I was teaching, the students play it who are in Watson High, mm -hmm. and we did a production, and it was amazing. It went off. People loved it. And then that play... Um, then I went to the Playwrights Conference, which happily was happening in Canberra. And um, I was in Norman Ahmed playing Ahmed, surprisingly. <laughs> <laughs> I was Giving you a Muslim. <laughs> yes, yes. In my very good uh, Pakistani accent, which I won't do now. Um, <laughs> and uh, coming out of that, it happened to be at the, at the middle of the Playwrights Conference we were doing it, and Nick Enright and um, Bill Shanahan and a lot of people came to see it. And uh, Bill Shanahan asked me if I wanted to come up to Sydney and he'd signed me up to his agency, so I did. Mm -hmm. um, and then I saw them, was picked out of... <laughs> In the early days of Griffin, plays were done very uh, randomly, and someone, um, Alan Beecher, picked uh, my play out of a drawer, and we all oh, must do this thing. And they did it, and uh, surprising, really surprisingly, it was a bit of a hit. This collection that we're, uh, that we're, that, that we're putting out is um, a group of... Um, Plays that you were commissioned to create, is yeah, that right? by I the mean, Bell Company. It, it, it came out of the Actors at Work is something that John Bell and Anna Volskos uh, established, and typical of John, he was wanting to take Shakespeare to everybody. Mm -hmm. and that was in the early days. It was kind of as they toured, wasn't yeah, it? They would. Yeah, I, right. I seem to remember they might get on a bus and if they're in Brisbane and go down to. That's right. North Coast or something that's like that. The, yeah. That's the level yeah. of commitment. So John would be doing, you know, I don't know, The Tempest or something in Queens, in, in Brisbane, mm. and he'd go to a number of schools. In those days, what they'd do then, would they would choose the, show, the, the bits of, the, the, say, Julius Caesar they were going to do, mm. the four or five speeches or four or five scenes, I should say, and then they'd kind of improvise around it. Mm. And the four actors would sort of role play that, you know, one was having an affair with someone else or someone was, you know, antsy for some reason. But it got really loose, so John then said to me, would you be interested in writing me scripts? Um, and I was absolutely thrilled, and he wanted the scripts written and structured. My remit was to talk about language, hmm. the language of Shakespeare, to, to, to um, disabuse people of the fact that the thought that it's impossible to get their head around, to talk about the world of Shakespeare, which is, includes the whole world of, that, hmm. of the Elizabethan world, of the flourishing of the arts, of the, all of that. To talk about characters and how character, how Shakespeare created characters, and finally to talk about theatricality, because if you and I say this every workshop I ever give, if you're really interested in theatre, pick up a Shakespearean play and just look at how he moves action and mm. how we discover what's going on, and there's no stage directions or very minimal, and that sort of thing. So within each text, I would look at those things in different ways. Mm depending on what the, what the theme was. Mm. And also that there's a variation in year level as well. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. So, so I've, I've written one um, called Magic Box, which is sort of an introduction to the world of Shakespeare. Uh, a couple of them are, I think, three or four are for junior years, a couple are for mid years. And then there's three intensive. Towards the end, we got this idea that we'll just focus on one text. So there's a Macbeth, a Hamlet, and a, and a Romeo and Juliet yeah, intensive. And they're, they're, they really focus on one text and, they, and they're intellectually quite challenging. Mm. So given that uh, the plays are conceived for, for actors or for professional actors going into schools, 
obviously in, in, what, what, once, that, once the plays themselves go into the classroom, there's a different way they can be used. And I'm just mm -hmm. wondering if you can talk about how you see that, how that might work yeah, for well, it, teachers. And, it's interesting. And because the, the scenes will go, the four actors will be discussing, say, uh, the music of Shakespeare's language. And then one of the characters, out of one, the, one of the players, say, I don't know, Ophelia, might suddenly start the mad speech, you know, from the drowning scene. Mm. Um, and then the actors will comment on it. Mm. They go, oh, stop. And, and like, she'll, she'll sort of stop. And, the, and then they'll explain what, that, what the metaphors were, and then mm. she'll continue. Mm. So what you could do in a classroom is have four, you could have four kids playing the actor one, two, three, four, mm. and then you have a whole, the whole class can play the rest. Mm. Mm. And I think the whole thing, and I'm sure we all agree about this, that with Shakespeare, you have to get up your feet and do it. You go mm. sitting around, we're all, you know. Well, I mean, the world is littered, isn't it, with, with um, people who've been tortured by Shakespeare in the classroom just reading and kind of what does it mean and, and, yeah. and then kind of getting to their mid-twenties, thirties going, I never ever want, want to, to see that again. again. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what, that's what we hit upon with these scripts is, is exactly that, is you'll, you'll get a little bit of a scene, so the beginning of the Lear Cordelia, Goran or Regan scene, you know, the, the nothing will come of nothing scene. Mm. And they'll go into that and they'll say, do two pages. Mm. And then there'll be all these comments. Mm. Oh, parents, kids. Mm. That's like me arguing with my mum. Mm. That's like me, my dad, would, you know, but we'll tell him something, tell our parents anything so we can borrow the car or mm. so we can go out and stay out late. So, and then you go back into the scene. Mm. So the whole point is to make it, um, to contextualise it for the, for the kids. And that's mm. why I, and I will be constantly updating them mm. so that the scripts remain relevant. Mm. So that, I mean, in the action in action one, I was just talking about um, uh, people's um, um, in poli in political spin and and uh and in indecision and, and not people knifing each other in the same way that that regan and goner will do to lear mm. and i quoted the current uh cri or the crisis from the labor party with a rudd gillard gillard no one could trust anyone and people are undermining each other so mm. that's the kind of thing you, you're trying to mm. keep drawing the parallels between made the parallels. that's what needs to be updated and so and there's references i just did yesterday on the Action in Action One, where I made a reference to Assad and to Syria, mm, mm. because that's constantly that's con and and, yeah. and I think that's something that John really liked that that because it encouraged the kids to, to open out rather than go in with mm. Shakespeare to look at the world, mm, mm, mm. and that's what his productions do, of course. Mm. I'm just interested because you are someone who's worked both sides of the fence. You know, you've worked as a teacher. Yeah. And then you've worked into the profession and then gone back to teaching and come, you, 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 know, you, you move back and forth between those two things. Um, wh what's, your, what's your opinion? I mean, and you're a parent as well. What's your opinion of um, what sort of deep function drama can give in education? And, and how broad do you think it, sh it could or might or should be applied? Um, I just had an experience teaching... Um, playwriting to a bunch of students in Bendigo, uh, local kids and Korean refugee kids. And we ran a course called Finding a Voice, a partnership between MTC, Arts Vic and Bendigo. And that was, sums up the, the, the answer to your question. And it was extraordinary what those kids, where they came from, particularly the Korean kids. Mm. The first day the Korean kids wouldn't come in the door, I had to sort of literally come in come in by the end of the of the of the, of the course uh they were standing on stage like this oh, wonderful. and they had never been on a stage before in their life they had never been in the theater before in their life um and i've seen that happen with with kids um with actors at work definitely and i think i think there is something in that kids love to perform mm. i think that that performing is a means of self-expression that you don't have anywhere else. I think for teenagers it's fantastic because you can let go of your teenage self. Mm. You become whatever you're doing. Mm. And once once the ground rules are created that, that say that you can do whatever you like, don't, I mean, do whatever you like as in play any character you like mm. or, you know, the, you don't raise the stakes to say you've got to be a professional actor. Once you get rid of that mm. and say anyone can do this, mm then I think what kids, teenagers get out of 
the arts is extraordinary. Mm. It's because it, it, it's part of our, you know, part of our creative soul, I suppose. Mm. Mm. And that kids are really open to it. And I've always thought it was extraordinary that when we leave school, everybody sort of, we stop. Mm. Go, hang on. Yeah, yeah, it is, a, it, 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 do, it, it is a thing, isn't it, where you get quite a lot of access to it at that age and then it does seem to stop. Yeah, and mm. as, as a society, I think we're, particularly in Australia, I think we're afraid of the art. I mean, we're not. Mm. <laughs> I mean, well, you know what I mean. I mean, artists aren't, people who, who teach drama aren't. I mean, they, every drama teacher I know goes for the same, you know, it's, it's full on, but you've got to convince the other you know, the yeah. rest of the staff that this is valid and worthwhile and every bit as important as footy or hockey or mm. anything else you might want to do. Mm. And in fact, probably more important. Um, but that, and that's difficult. But I mean, I think there's, there's every, every one of those drama teachers would be saying, this is a really valid subject. I mean, that, and that sort of leads me to my kind of final question, I guess, which is, um, and, and I ask this, you know, with particular reference to... Um, the, the organisation, um, Australian Plays, um, which is obviously dedicated to, you know, Australian writing. Um, and in there, I guess there's an argument that says the, the dominance of, you know, in the theatrical tradition of not only Shakespeare, but Chekhov particularly, um, Strindberg, Ibsen, whatever. Do you know what I mean? There, there are people who, who are writers who are, you know, clearly completely brilliant, and Shakespeare's probably generally considered the king of those people. But they do dominate the tradition, and I'm just wondering, as a playwright yourself, as an Australian artist, beyond the fact that, you know, they're, they're amazing plays, how do you see... Is it, is it the universality that, that means that, that that's why they sit inside our consciousness in the way that they do, or is it their politics? Is it their style? Is it... I mean, it's a big question, but I'm just... I think it's uh, yeah, worth addressing I, in this context. You know? Yeah, look, I do think it's interesting. I think the thing, and I only really discovered this and understood this when I was started writing the, uh, these scripts, is that, that Shakespeare, that there's obviously the universal thing about human nature, mm -hmm. and I think that's, that, that's the other thing that comes from, I mean, I saw the cherry orchard the other day, and I mean, Chekhov, it's about us mm -hmm. at our most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and kids... You're not going to get anyone more vulnerable than a teenager. Mm. So you see characters that plays are about. I mean, all the people you quoted about characters who are vulnerable, and I mean, and you know, people can talk about because style changes, obviously. And you know, if you did a Chekhov or an Ibsen, as it was done in the 19th century, people would fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in fact, I saw one that was like that, and the whole audience was asleep, and I it just won't say who it was. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, if you, if you, and I think Simon Stone's really brilliant at this, if you pull out the marrow of the players, the marrow is about us as human beings. Mm. And the Romeo and Juliet, I mean, it's a classic. Once you, once you distill that and say, well, what's that about? It's about a boy falling in love with a girl within 12 lines of the passion. Mm. Like they're hot for each other. They're mm. young, one's 14, one's 13 or 12 or 14, whatever they are. I mean, that is, that's the audience you're, just talk, you're talking to. Mm. Then you've got a hot-headed cousin who wants to... Be, then you've got the hot-headed friend, Mercutio. And then you've got these ga you know, gangs, and that's out in the playground. Mm. So, you know, there is a... There's a and these disconnected parents, of Disconnected course, well, parents. You know, yeah. There's a nurse who's sort of a surrogate mum who she's running out in the balcony to get away from. Mm. And, you know, oh, there's the boyfriend. I mean, God, that could be in any town. And I think... Um, one of the things that we, with these scripts is when they were playing, say, for instance, to Indigenous communities out up in the Territory, mm. they were kind of wrapped because they're going, that's my life. Mm. You know, that's me climbing out the window, heading off to see yeah. my <laughs> boyfriend or my girlfriend or whatever it is. So I think it is in... And I think the thing, as I said earlier, the thing with Shakespeare is that if you want any introduction, and I wish I'd had it when I started writing, because, you know, because a lot of, particularly my earlier work is... You could say it's sort of televisual in a way. It's not incredibly theatrical, and I've had to learn that. And if I'd learned, if I'd done this, what I'd done writing these scripts that before I wrote us or them, mm. it probably would have been a different play. Mm. Um, I'm, you know, love it and I'm mm. proud of it and all that. But you have to keep growing as an artist. And the thing that Shakespeare shows you is, is you know how what you know. I, once more to the breach, dear friends. Once more, you know, one man stands on stage with a sword. We believe that there's a ten thousand men out there, mm, mm, you know, mm, on a stilly, mm. stilly night, and all that sort of stuff. Mm. So, and I think that's what's great about Shakespeare. Mm. Um, but I do think it's 
the, it's a theme that particularly kids connect to. Mm. Yeah, and I think also just picking up on what, what, what you were just referencing with um, Henry V or, or whatever, it's also for me, I think, the, 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 the size with which those people think in those plays, isn't it? It's yeah, a, absolutely. And for teenagers particularly, that, that's such a, a liberation to go, I can, you know, I'm allowed to think about things in a more well, lurid way or yeah, lurid way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that doing the finding your voice thing that, that I'm really excited about doing is teaching kids playwriting is the moment you say you can use your own language. Mm. You, you know, whatever is a lion. Mm. Is a lion. <laughs> Don't know. Dot, dot, dot is a lion. Yeah. And you go, you can have your language. Yeah. And then when you start describing the Shakespearean language and you actually look at those speeches as the, the characters do in these scripts, they suddenly go, oh my God, that's, I've heard that saying, of course there's millions of them yeah. that he invented, yeah. but they also, that language becomes accessible and, and in fact is their language. Yeah. You know, yeah. the hot-headed language of Mercutio or, the, or, or you know, the Iago's conspiring or, mm. you know, any of those things. They even goes, because you go, well, that's what someone does in the playground, mm. you mm. know. Mm. So yeah, I think I think that's, and I think there's uh, incredible excitement once once you get the shackles off. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Ned. Thank you very much. <laughs>